include um, uh, pragmatics, language policy, and academic spoken uh, discourse. She uh, was the second, editor of the that? JOLT journal. Persona, we need to start yeah, sure. recording. Oh, sorry. Good. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it's been recorded. Yes. So, um, yeah, okay. I'll just go, go on. Okay. So she was also the editor of the JOLT journal for uh, three years. Um, so the presentation will be about one hour long and we will take questions um, for about 10 minutes. Uh, so over to you, uh, Dr. Howard. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just share my PowerPoint. Okay, can everyone see that? Is that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I'd like to thank you all for having me today. Um, and particularly thanks to my friend, Dr. Farzana, my friend of many years. I think she's been working really hard to put this whole thing together. So I was really happy um, when she asked me to do this. Um, this is a, I'm coming to you from my home in uh, southern Japan in the town of Miyazaki. That's a photograph uh, taken near my house. Like everywhere else in rural Japan, it's a beautiful view ruined by a lot of electrical wires, but that's basically where I'm living. That's about 9.30 at night here. Um, and I'm also, um, as Farzana mentioned, I have been involved with THT. So I've been coming to Bangladesh almost every year since 2007, not this year, obviously. Um, and this year I've been really missing going there and meeting my friends and eating delicious food. So I'm really happy to have uh, this opportunity to connect with everyone. So um, I will, these are the, the sections of my talk, I will introduce myself very briefly and we'll talk about the types of publications that you can choose and like how to choose them, um, what steps you go through to getting published. Um, and then I'll do some problems and frequently asked questions. Um, and then I'll take your questions. As the title suggests, this is sort of pitched at people who have not done much publishing before. I think it's something that um, we are required to do um, pretty much, you know, as soon as you get a university job, at least in Japan, you have to start producing research. And it's not something that anyone in my graduate school ever told me about. And it was very intimidating when I started. Um, so that's kind of who I'm aiming at. In the problems and frequently asked questions, these are questions that my, uh, my colleagues ask me. It's, it's things that sometimes I think people maybe with more publishing experience wonder about. And so um, I hope I can... Um, say something of interest to most uh, of you this evening. Okay, so this is my own background. Um, oops, sorry. This is my own background. Um, I volunteered, I got sort of started um, because I have been in my professional organization, which is the Japan Association for Language Teaching. I've been a member for, um, a very long time, about 20 years now. Um, and when I was first a member, I decided to become, I volunteered to be a newsletter editor for my special interest group, which is Pragmatic Special Interest Group. They just needed one and I just said, well, I'll just give it a shot. Um, so that was kind of how I got started. Um, and then what happened then was um, I got the chance to work on a proceedings for a small conference. So we did my special interest group and some others. Um, we did a small uh, conference. We had a really, really small proceedings. It was like eight papers, but the editor dropped out at the last minute. They had some sort of family emergency and they couldn't finish it. And so um, I, I and one other person um, had to get the whole proceedings out in about a month. And it was very difficult, um, but I realized I really liked editing um, and it was a really good experience. I've never had such a difficult 
experience, uh, editing experience since then. But um, the, that was quite interesting for me. And so um, then after that, I became a reviewer for our uh, conference publication, our proceedings. And then um, the Jolt Journal, if you're the editor, you have to have a PhD. Um, so as I was finishing my PhD, just by chance, they were looking for another editor. It's hard to find um, editors for uh, scholarly publications, I think, in general. Um, you, it's a totally volunteer job. You don't get any money at all. And it's basically another half a job on top of your regular job. Um, so they were looking for something and I knew that I liked editing and I, you know, I had a little bit of experience and so um, they asked me to do it and so I was associate editor for two years and then I was the regular editor for three years. Um, that's supposed to be two years we couldn't find a replacement so I had to do it an extra year by myself. And today I'm on the editorial board of the JALT Journal. I'm on the editorial board of the conference publication. And I also review for a few um, journals. I review a lot for TESOL Journal and I review for applied linguistics and some other things that I can't remember. I, they're kind of one-offs. And I also um, you know, write articles and stuff. So I think I can sort of look at the editorial process from all angles. So now I'm gonna talk about the types of publications that you can publish in. And the first thing that you have to decide is if you have a theoretical article or if you have a practical article, publications tend to be divided along those lines. Um, usually it's sometimes it's a different publication. So in the case of JALT, JALT Journal is our theoretical publication and the language teacher is our practical one. TESOL has TESOL Quarterly, which is theoretical and TESOL Journal, which is practical. Um, even if it's the, in the same publication, you're usually sending them to different editors. They're in different sections. So you have to kind of decide which one your publication, your article, is. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit difficult. It's, it's the way it works in publishing is it's a dichotomy, but it isn't really, it's more of a continuum, right? So if, if you're way on the one side of the, the if you're way on the theory side, you're probably going to have some pedagogical implications. And if you're over here way on the practice side where it's just a description of, a, of an activity or a lesson plan or something, you're still going to have some theoretical grounding even if you don't have it like written in your article. So um, some of the maybe kind of obvious differences um, is um, one is the use of references. So in a theoretical article, you are using the references to show your place in the research. Maybe you're showing a gap that your, your research is um, filling, um, or maybe you're just giving background, but you're probably going to have a lot of references and you're going to want them to be up to date. On the practical side, you might have references if you are using ideas that people are not familiar with. Um, so in some cases, the journal will limit the number of references that they allow you to use. In others, you'll be encouraged not to use unnecessary ones. Okay. Uh, theoretical articles are longer than practical ones. Uh, theoretical ones, you're looking at about 10 pages. Practical is maybe two to five. Um, a theoretical article is relatively difficult to publish. In fact, it's quite difficult to publish, um, depending on where you're publishing. Um, so, and a practical article is a little bit easier. So a theoretical article, I, in the JALT journal, when I was publishing, we had a 90 to 92% um, rejection rate, um, which 
does sound rather high and it's probably the same for TESOL quarterly, but I'll explain some stuff about that later, I think. A practical journal, in our practical journal, um, they have about a 70% rejection rate. Maybe we should more positively think of that as a 30% acceptance rate. Um, so it's, it's a little bit easier to do that with a practical journal. And then um, the theoretical journal is going to contain original research or original ideas based on published research. And the practical journal is going to contain um, original classroom practice. So if you're right in the middle of this continuum and you're not sure where you should send your article, number four here is kind of the key. If the focus of your article is on your original classroom practice, then that's a practical article. Um, usually theoretical articles don't have original practice. It's a, a practice that is accepted or a, um, a teaching method or something that is pretty well accepted, but we are learning more things about it and we're doing more research about it. If you thought of your own idea of how to do something in your classroom, then that's probably a practical article. Um, because the theoretical ones are more difficult to publish, they are more prestigious and we do get things that are clear where the, the author is trying to present their own idea about what to do in the classroom, but they add on like a survey or a test or something to make it into a theoretical article. But it's at base, the focus on, is on the practice. And so we generally send them to our, our practical publication. Okay. So again, with uh, types of publications, the first kind is a journal. And as I said, it's research, uh, divided into research and practice. And the way that you can do this is to, um, um, usually the submission guidelines are in the web page or they will always be in the, uh, in the journal if it's a paper journal. Um, and one of the important things that you want to look at when you're looking at submission guidelines is what we call the remit, which is basically the rules for what goes in the journal. For example, with my particular journal, we don't publish things, research that's been done outside of Japan. Okay, um, so that's kind of a basic level. Um, and a lot of those, 90% of people who got rejected by my journal did it because they were they ignored the remit. Um, we had a, we had many many people every day um, submitting things that we would not publish because they didn't take place in Japan. So it just saves you a little bit of money if you will a little bit of money a little bit of time if you. Um, be sure you check the remit um, as a basis and read the submission guidelines carefully. So a book chapter, a book chapter is slightly easier to publish, although I don't have statistics for this, but with a book chapter, like the book is gonna be on one specific topic. And so um, like a, a research journal, it's just a shot in the dark. You don't know whether they're gonna like your topic or not. But with the book chapter, you already know that the book, the, the topic that the book is on. So your chap chapter has a better chance of being accepted. Also with a research journal, you have to go through through peer review, um, but with a book chapter, you're just basically going through the editors. Do they, if the editors like it, um, then you're in. Book chapters are, um, I think most of them we find out about through word of mouth, and it's a really good reason for being part of your professional organization. That's where all of the book chapters I've published in, I found out through like um, friends who were in JALT or through um, notices on JALT web, uh, you know, boards on Facebook and things like that. Um, but they do have calls for um, chapters in linguist list that you can look up, but um, it's a good idea to have a network so that you find out about those. And the last two are a little bit easier for people who have not published before. It's a really good way of getting your feet wet. The first is a book review where, you know, just as it says, you, you get a book and you review it. Um, the way that you do this varies from journal to journal. So you check the reviews section um, to see what what they want you to do. In some cases, they will have lists of books that they want reviewed and then you will write and 
and say you want to do the review and they send you a copy. Um, in some cases, I think you would query the editor about um, something that you want to review. If you're reviewing a textbook, they will want you to use it in your class. Um, but these are not peer reviewed. They are just edited in most cases. Um, so they're a little bit easier um, to do. And they're of course quite short. And then the last is the proceedings. It's fairly easy to get accepted for proceedings because you've already been accepted for the conference. Um, so in order to do this one, you have to make sure that your conference, you know, if you want to do this, you have to get accepted to a conference and you must be sure that the conference is going to have a proceedings because they don't always. Um, but a con, uh, in, our, in the case of our proceedings, for example, we accept about 75% of the people who um, send something to the proceedings. And you've already done most of the work because you, pre you um, prepared for the conference. So just some basic tips about preparing your manuscript. Obviously, it should be free of errors. Um, it's going to change a lot in the, in the publication process, um, but it should, you should start off giving your best impression. So um, really check it quite carefully um, and have somebody else check it if you possibly can. Um, most of the journals are going to have a blind review and they will ref um, they'll require you to send one blind copy. You might want you might have to do two copies, one which is blind and one which isn't, or you might just send the blind one. So for the for a blind copy, you want to take out your name and if um, if you're if you mention your school, for example, in your article, um, you'll want to anonymize your school um, by saying something like a large university in Dhaka or something like that. Um, one thing that people tend to um, oh sorry I forgot if you're um, citing yourself in your own article, then you have to take out the citations um, that are of your own work. So. Most people, this is done in different ways. Most people write author instead of their name and XXXX instead of the year. And then you take out the citations in the reference list as well. One thing that people forget to do is to remove the metadata. Metadata will um, identify you and the reviewers should not be looking at you, the metadata, but sometimes they do. Um, and if I tell you how to, um, remove metadata, I'm, I'm going to screw it up. I'm going to mess it up. So if you Google how to remove metadata, it's a very simple process. I think it's, it's on, I think it's in the file menu, but it's, um, you, that is something else to do. Um, um, lastly, this seems obvious, but I've gotten just really bad abstracts in the past. Do write, write the abstract very carefully. Um, a lot of people seem to just write, be very careless when they're writing the abstract. And I think it's because a lot of people save it to the end. And so like, you know, you're kind of done with the whole subject and you're tired and you just like toss out this hundred word abstract and then you're done. Um, but the abstract is one of the more important parts of your paper. When the editor sends it out to reviewers, um, they will probably send the abstract uh, to attract reviewers and see if, if they want to review it. And you want the reviewers to start out with a really good impression of your, of your paper. Um, and then if your paper is uh, published, then the abstract is going to be the face of your paper. That's how people decide they're going to download it or, or whatever. So, um, so do write it very carefully, check it a few times. I think it's a good idea to maybe show it to a friend and have them describe like what the, um, what the article is about to make sure that you're hitting the important parts um, in your abstract. Okay, here I have a flow chart, which I'm afraid is maybe a little bit confusing, um, but I'll go through it and see if we can make sense of it. Okay, so um, after your submission, the editor will review it and might reject it at that point. That's called a desk reject. Um, and if that happens, 
you, um, if you get feedback, uh, most editors will give you feedback. It might be very, very short, um, but consider the feedback um, and either change it according to the feedback and submit it to a different journal or don't change it and try another journal. Um, I will say that if I'm desk rejecting it and it's not because it doesn't fit the, re the remit, usually it had really kind of big problems in the paper. Um, either like maybe the research design was fundamentally flawed or something like that. Um, when an editor rejects it, it's because we don't think it's going to be able to get through review. And if we send it to reviewers, it's wasting their time and it's wasting the author's time. Um, but if you do get a, a desk reject, really uh, consider the feedback carefully. Okay. okay, if the editor thinks it will make it through review, then they will send it to the journal's reviewers, usually two of them, uh, sometimes one um, uh, or three, but yeah, th two is about the industry standard. Okay. Um, and at that point, it could also be rejected, in which case you'd go through the same, same steps. Okay, I'm just gonna do that. Okay, so I'll see if I can explain this in a way that is not confusing. So it says here, except for publication, um, but that's a little bit misleading. They're sort of putting it further in the publication process. So if you're accepted with no revisions or with minor revisions, that does mean that you're accept that you're pretty much provisionally accepted. If it says accept with major revisions, that's actually a revise and resubmit. And that basically means the editor is not promising that they will um, publish your paper, even if you do the revisions. Okay. Uh, Okay, so if you have minor revisions, it's going to go, um, after you turn in the revisions, the editor and possibly one other of the um, reviewers will review it one more time, and then probably they will accept it. As I said, minor revisions is basically a provisional acceptance. With major revisions, it's gonna go back to the reviewers, um, and the reviewers will look at it, again, at it again. It could go for minor revisions, in which case you just go through one more round and be accepted. Theoretically, you could have major revisions again at this point. At that point, like if we got major revisions twice, we'd probably reject the article. Um, but in theory, you could go through two rounds of major revisions. Um, okay, yes. So I hope that is clear. Um, with no revisions is a theoretical possibility, but I've never heard of anyone doing that. Um, major revisions is by far the most common outcome that you're going to get. Okay, yes, and there's another way to get rejected. Uh, okay, okay, I hope that is clear. This is a little bit complicated, sorry. I didn't make it, it was a friend of mine did this very kindly, but. Anyway, okay, so revising your manuscript. As I said, revise and resubmit is the most, or major revisions, that's the most common. And that is a very good outcome. Um, if at, the, in, at your initial time when you submit, you have about an eight to 10% chance of being published, but once you get a revise and resubmit, you have a 75% chance of being published. Most of these we eventually accept. Um, so if you have, um, if you get this outcome, you should carefully read the comments and revise your manuscript. It's very nice to write the comments on a chart, um, you know, put the comments on one side that the, just, just that you get from the reviewer and on the other side of the review, of the chart, um, put how you revised it and where the reader can find the revision. Some places um, require this, but even if it's not required, it's a really good idea. It does show them that you are like 
looking at each comment and taking it seriously. If you have a small disagreement about one of the comments, you can write that in the chart. You can write your reason for not um, uh, accepting the revision or not do, revising it in the way that, um, that they said. Um, publishing a research article takes a really long time. It's going to take about a year to 18 months for a research article. A chapter, a book chapter is going to take even longer. I've never had a book chapter take under two years. So you do need to budget some time. Um, practical articles are um, considerably faster. In my experience, that's usually about six months. Um, rather than a year. So if you have to publish fast, um, a good strategy is start planning your research article and get your practical article out right away. Okay, gonna do frequently asked questions. Sorry, I'm just gonna take a little sip of water so that I can, I've been teaching um, today, so I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, this is something that a lot of people really worry about, um, but it's a really common problem. What if I disagree with the comments or if I don't understand them? And what if they disagree with each other? Um, as I said, if you have a small disagreement, then you can just write it in your chart, write why you didn't think it was um, appropriate or something like that. If you have a major uh, disagreement, you can write to the editor. And this does not mean that your submission will automatically be rejected. Most editors believe that you have the right to, you know, um, uh, to assert your opinion about, about what you've written. You're the owner of that. So um, you, ha you have to write, um, write your reasons in a fairly clear and non-emotional way. Um, if you're flexible, like if you're if you disagree with all of the comments, that's probably not going to fly. But even if you have a major disagreement, um, there was one time at my at my journal when we had somebody who uh, disagreed very much with one of my reviewers and wrote why um, in a really nice way, and I showed it to the reviewer and said, can we work out a compromise? The reviewer didn't think so. And so I sent it to a, a third reviewer. Um, and so between them, they were able to come up with something that the author and the reviewers could all kind of live with. I had to be the, the go-between because the whole thing was anonymous. Um, but I think most, um, most editors will work with you on this. What if the reviewers disagree with each other? This is also something that like happens all the time. So, and that's also, if it's not clear from the comments that you get from the editor, then you should ask which of the comments uh, to pay attention to. Most editors have like an alpha reviewer and a beta reviewer. You have two reviewers and one is always gonna be the one that you listen to. It either because they have the subject expertise or because they have more experience or sometimes they're just a better reviewer. And I've gotten um, papers back where the editor will say something like, you'll want to pay particular attention to reviewer number two. And then I know reviewer number two is the, the, the better reviewer. A lot of times you can just tell when you read your, your comments. Um, but if that's not clear to you, then by all means, ask the editor. The editor probably has an idea already um, of which one you should, you should pay attention to. Okay. And I get this question all the time um, from like my friends and I've gotten it at, you know, when I'm doing a workshop like this. Um, if you don't hear anything for a long time, yes, yes, call, contact the editor, absolutely. Um, editors, you know, lose stuff and they forget things and uh, email problems happen. Um, you will not offend the editor. Well, you might offend them if you, you know, do it very fast. But um, another thing I'm frequently asked is like, how long should I wait? And I really don't know. Um, if, you're not if you're not told anything, then if I hadn't heard anything in like two months, I'd probably send a message. Um, our editorial policy was they had to get a response within a month. 
uh, from just from the initial editors um, read through. Um, and so after that, I'd expect somebody to, to contact me. But if you haven't heard anything, I think it's perfectly reasonable to contact the editor. Okay. This is about withdrawing a paper, which is a really sticky um, situation. And this is the thing that my colleagues have the most problem with. So it is kind of a serious thing. It, um, remember I said that once you get a revise and resubmit, you have a much better chance of being published. So remember withdrawing your paper might mean that um, you, know, you, you, you don't have that, that chance to publish anymore. Um, so there's that. And then that it's also, it can be very um, inconvenient for an editor. Um, in my case, I really sort of counted on all of the articles that had gotten to the end of review. Um, I pretty much, you know, had a place for them in the, um, in the journal. And so if somebody withdrew at the last minute, it, it meant a, it wasn't a disaster, but it did mean usually a very thin issue. And it might mean that somebody else's article that could have gotten in there um, didn't because it was just too late, right? Um, so first, if the comments, um, if you dislike the comments, um, really consider like if you, if you think that, that your paper is just not gonna be the paper that you wanna write anymore, if, you, if it doesn't feel like it's your work anymore, and if the um, if the editor and the reviewers are being very inflexible about that, then I would say that's a good reason to withdraw. If you're going to regret it coming out in the way that they want it to, um, then I would consider withdrawing. If it's taking too long, um, I would again ask the editor, um, what's going on, like what stage of the editorial process is it in? Um, but that's also something to just, you know, just plan on it taking a while as well. Um, authors do have to withdraw for personal reasons um, because, you know, you, you have a new job and you, you, you get busy or something like that. But um, do ask the editor first if they can be, you know, flexible about times or something like that. Um, so the answer is yes, um, you can withdraw your paper. Um, try to do it as soon as you possibly can. Uh, it, it's, it's just better for the editor if you do that, um, if you do it as soon as, as you can. And again, try to be um, not too emotional about that decision. Okay. Um, I, if you try to revise your article um, according to the, what the reviewers said and they ask you to put in new information and it's making the article longer, what should uh, you do? This is also a really, um, this is a very, very common uh, situation. So what a word limit is, um, in the case of a paper journal, a word limit is so that the journal does not become so heavy that it goes over whatever you've budgeted for a postage, right? So you wanna keep your journal to a certain page limit um, so that you can send it for whatever, you know, you've decided you can send, whatever money you have to send uh, to, for postage, okay. So that was the case with my journal. It's a paper journal. But that was predicated on the idea that we were going to have six articles per journal, which never happened. So usually I had at least one article's worth of pages that I could, um, that I could let an author use if they were revising their paper and, uh, and needed a little bit, a few more extra words, I could let them do that. Um, if the journal is online, then um, basically the word limit is just because of the genre. Um, they don't want people to write a novel. They want someone to write something that a busy professional can read in an hour, or maybe two. Okay, so in that case, the word limit is probably fairly flexible, uh, but do ask the, um, 
the editor first uh, if that's the problem that you're having. Um, so this is when you're turning in your revisions. When you do your initial submission, you should be really careful to meet the word limit. Uh, as I said, um, I didn't really care with the initial submissions because A, it's going to get edited a lot anyway, and B, I did usually have the extra space. So I never even bothered to count words when they came in. But some of my reviewers would uh, immediately count all of the words as soon as they got the article and they would write me an email and say, she may have the word limit. Um, and I didn't really care. but. Um, but it does give the reviewer maybe a more negative view of your, your article. Maybe they start out thinking, wow, does this person really need to talk this much about that, right? So just to be on the safe side, I think it's best um, if you stay within the word limit for the initial publication, there may be, oh, sorry, for the initial submission, there may be a little bit more um, uh, flexibility when you do your your uh, revisions. Okay, so this is a really touchy, this is really something that we have to be careful about. So publishing more than one article on one study or one piece of research um, is possible. Most people do that. This is called salami slicing and it's very important not to slice the salami too thinly. So you have to be very careful that your articles do not overlap. Um, so they have to have a different focus um, and they have to be pretty much entirely rewritten. So for example, if you did one you know, study and you wanna do two articles, um, each article is going to have a different focus. You're probably going to use the same lit review, but you have to rewrite it. The only exception to this is your methods section um, sometimes because there's only a certain um, number of ways that a person can say something like a t-test was performed, right? So um, in that case, sometimes it's okay if the method section is um, a lot the same. Most people actually do this. I mean, if you, if you, um, you know, if you're doing a, a PhD, you want to do more than one you want to get more than one publication and you might be working with a single data set. Um, so it is very possible to do this, um, but if it overlaps too much, this is something that really makes editors nervous. Uh, more, pretty much more than anything else is self-plagiarism. Other people's plagiarism, like plagiarizing other people actually isn't very common and, um, and yeah, it, it isn't very common and it's not something that people do um, accidentally. It's, it's usually kind of on purpose, um, but people can accidentally plagiarize themselves by, ha by having more than one article out there that are, that is too, um, they resemble each other a little too much. So to be on the safe side, it's a good idea to, um, to inform the editor um, that that you have another article out there that's on you know the same study or something like that, and give the uh, editor the chance to look at it first. So the consequences of accidentally self plagiarizing is um, the 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 journal has to withdraw the article, which is really embarrassing for the journal, um, and um, then that entails like either a notice on your on the website, or it would be um, a page in a in a in a paper journal. So it's not just a matter of the article disappearing. They would actually say we have withdrawn this article, um, and then the editor is uh, within their rights to inform the author's um, place of business and professional organization about that too. So it's really important to. Um, to be on the safe side as far as that goes and always ask the editor if you're in doubt. Um, can the editor tell me if my topic is suitable before I write the paper? Pretty much no. Um, and I got queries about that all the time. When I was shadowing, when I was an associate editor and I was shadowing the editor, 
Um, she used to get things like that and she would always reply, no, I would have to see the whole paper. And I understand that you don't want the author to think you've promised to publish it. And so it's, it's more cautious to say, please send the whole paper. Um, but when I was editor, I had one person write in asking me this question and the topic was completely unsuitable. I mean, we would, we would never, I don't think it was, you know, anything to do with applied linguistics. It, it was just nothing we would publish. And so I thought, oh, okay, yeah, thanks for writing. No, we wouldn't publish that, you know, have a nice day or whatever. And um, I got back this really angry thing about like, well, you haven't even seen the whole article. I'm gonna, you know, write more stuff about linguistics and, and uh, you know, you shouldn't be so prejudiced and things like that. So after that, I just, whether, no matter what it was, I just said no. And most editors I think will not tell you uh, something like this. You have to finish the paper before or they can tell you. Okay, academia.com or ResearchGate or something like this. Um, some are journals, in fact, I think most journals are fine with this. There are some publishers that, that will not let you do it, but I think most of them will. But don't do it before publication. Um, the journal doesn't want to have another version of the article floating around. And as you know, once you put it on on the website, it's just out there forever. Um, so we've actually turned somebody down because his article was on academia.com. So hold off on doing that until you have the publication and then it's probably okay. It's always okay to put uh, just the, um, the reference on academia.com. Okay, I think I have, yeah, I have more time, okay. This is really hard to answer. So the difference between a school paper and a publishable paper, editors get papers all the time and you can tell it was written for a school assignment. And way back when I was, you know, a master's student, I was told this, that, you know, school paper is not a publishable paper, but nobody was ever really able to tell me like why. And it's actually, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to say in general. Um, but it's a totally different audience. So the, the purpose of a paper that you're writing for your MA or even your PhD is to show your teacher who is an expert that you understand the course content or you understand something that you've read. Um, and they tend, school papers tend to be too wordy as they are to be a publishable paper. I think when you're a student, you really, you know, you want to use a lot of language to sort of uh, convince the teacher that, that you know what you're talking about, right? Um, so they, they do tend to be too wordy. Um, I often got things that were, for example, uh, just a literature review. And that's not something a research journal will usually publish. Sometimes you'll see something that's like um, state of the art about like a topic. And that's something that a journal has probably commissioned an, es um, an expert or asked an expert to write. Um, they've asked them to sort of like uh, do a review of published research. Usually if you're writing like a, a literature review about something that's really accepted practice, um, it's just not original enough for a, um, for a research journal uh, and about some something someone would want to read. We do want things that are, again, original and not too much, um, I don't know how to say this, not too uh, similar to other things that are published, right? So an editor doesn't make the same kind of decisions, an, an academic editor, doesn't make the same kind of decisions that like a magazine editor does. So we don't really care if things are popular um, because we're not selling single, people aren't like seeing a single issue and buying it on a newsstand, right? So um, yeah, we, we don't really um, choose papers according to, to popularity. In fact, I really like to find something that's, that's really unusual um, so that, yeah, to get that work out there. Um, so a lot of times um, what we're looking at is, is a, a paper that just is, it would be very familiar to a practitioner and something that contains facts that would be known to most researchers, 
right? That's the sort of thing that you might do in your master's course to show your, your professor that you understand the course content, um, but it's not really publishable. Okay, so this doesn't really fall within the, per whoopsie, um, that doesn't really fall within the purview of an editor, um, but I'm. This is something that I'm really interested in. I'm. I'm the head of my research committee, and I help uh, teachers and students to do research at my school. And one of the the interesting things that I found um, about um, that I've, I'm finding right now, and it's more. There's more of this is happening because of the pandemic, which is there are so many more opportunities to work with other people right now. So if you don't want to actually do a research project with somebody else, um, and that's actually a really good idea if you can find somebody that you, you trust um, who's interested in the same sort of thing. Um, but if you don't want to do that, uh, there's um, accountability groups. So um, I belong to a group and we meet every once in a while and we just say, here's what I did and here are my goals for the next meeting, which would be in the next, you know, in a couple of weeks, I think we have them. Um, and here are my goals for the next week. And you just um, say that. I know in some accountability groups, they like buy coffee for everybody if they haven't finished what they said they were or something like that. Um, I have a friend who belongs to a Zoom group and they turn off their cameras and their microphones and they work independently for 45 minutes and then everybody turns their camera and microphone on and they talk about their work for 15 minutes. And I think they, they work for like two hours like that and they're able to sort of talk out their ideas and then have time when which is set aside just for working. So there's so many opportunities like that right now and we're, we're becoming more aware of that because we're having to zoom and do things like that all the time. Okay, um, another just general question, open access journals, are they okay? And I hope, yeah, I think so. Um, I'm not sure about the situation in Bangladesh. Um, I know in Japan, there are some universities that still um, are very suspicious of open access. But I think we know that um, for-profit academic publishing is kind of a racket where you know they're getting the publisher is getting the content for free and they're getting a lot of labor for free because we have to do things like that um, and then they're charging you $35 to have access for 24 hours um, so a lot of people are rebelling and starting open access journals and um, I hope that they will continue to be more acceptable. My journal is basically open access after about, I think we embargo it for either one issue or one year, which would be two issues because we want the members to get, you know, first crack at it because they're paying. Um, but open access uh, journals, I think are great. Okay, they're not necessarily predatory and I'm talking about predatory publishers on the next slide. So a predatory publisher um, is one in which you are basically paying to get your, your paper published. Um, a predatory publisher, they might contact you after you've done a presentation. Usually like a, an international publication, you might get an email that says, we heard you did this presentation, would you like to publish it? Um, and that's probably not a real publisher. Publisher, like a real academic publisher, they, they, they usually don't do things like that. So, um, so they may contact you after you've done a, a presentation. They may promise publication, which is again a thing that an academic publication usually doesn't do. And a really short turnaround time, like they'll say, you know, it will be in re peer review for like two weeks or 10 days or something like that. Those are all signs that it's, um, that it's a predatory one and they're going to ask you for a lot of money. Um, even if you decide that it's worth the risk and maybe your university or the one that you want to work in won't recognize the name and won't know it's predatory, what sometimes happens is um, you pay a lot of money and they put you up on a website and then the website disappears after a while. So you've basically paid for kind of nothing. If you're in doubt about a publication, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry. If you're in doubt about a publication, there are a lot of academics who are dedicated to, um, uh, to exposing these uh, predatory publishers. So if you 
um, put the name of the journal or something into Google and then type predatory publisher, you'll probably get an answer right away. You'll probably, it'll probably pop right up if it's predatory. Okay. Okay, I think I'm at the end of my time. I think I have exactly 10 minutes if I'm, if I'm timing myself, right? So um, I think I can, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. All right, so I can I can take some questions if anybody's got them. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, so uh, uh, I think we will take questions now. Okay. Um, those of you who have questions, you can write those in your chat box. Um, I have and, some already uh, you can that I got. Yourself and ask those questions. I'm just going through. Hi. Yeah, there is a question from. Um, Arifa Rahman, our colleague okay. at the okay. Lab. Mm -hmm. Yes, so she asked Dr. Howard, as a reviewer and an editor, do you have a bullet list of specific areas of a paper you initially look at to even consider reviewing it more carefully? You mentioned the abstract, of course, and what uh, else, uh, but what else? Um, or do you go for a full review right away for each submission? Okay, uh, thanks. That's a really good question. Um, I, when I'm an editor, um, I will usually do a uh, basically a full read of the paper. Um, but what I'm looking for is um, the abstract first. I generally do a check of the um, of the references. I want to see that there's enough of them and they are up to date enough, um, and then kind of things that we that we watch out for is um, if you propose a question um, you have to have an answer for it in your in your paper um, unless you specifically say I didn't find an answer that's also an answer right but um, you have to if you propose a question you're going to have to have um, an answer other things that we would look out for is like kind of overstating your claims um, which is um, this is really kind of a common error in in uh, in a paper is something like no one has ever you know no one has ever published a paper on this before at least do a, a google scholar search before you before you make that claim but those are just some general things that we're going to be looking at but i would probably do a careful review of of anything before i desk rejected it thank you i hope that answers that um, Dr. Arifa yeah. Rahman is actually our um, editor of our journal. Oh, uh, I'm the executive <laughs> editor. <laughs> Shamshan Pai is the editor. Uh -huh. yeah, she's, uh, yeah she, sorry, she's the executive editor. Yeah. And Dr. Yeah. Shamshan Murtaza is the editor. And uh, so there are some more questions here. Here, uh, Dr. Howard, can you give suggestions on which journals or websites uh, the younger researchers should aim for publishing their paper for the first time? Well, it is a, a thing that I review for, but they don't pay me. So I think I can say um, TESOL Journal, I think um, it's a, I think um, it's got a good, it's got that, it's got the TESOL name. Um, they seem to send um, quite a few things out for review. They seem, um, so there's not a lot of desk rejections. So you would get at the very least, you would get a full review of your paper by two reviewers. And they are really dedicated to publishing um, articles that don't get published. Like most, most articles are by university researchers and by people um, who are what we you know, might call inner circle people, people who are in the, the English speaking, native English speaking uh, circle, right? But TESOL wants to sort of get out of that. So you have a lot of articles by high school teachers, community college teachers, and lots of people outside of the United States. Um, so I think they, they are uh, dedicated to, to publishing people like that. And I think it's a, I think it's a good venue um, for maybe people who are starting out Mm -hmm. One more question from Anushia. Okay, she asked, um, how can we steer clear of predatory journals? Um, yes, just as I, as I said, um, any, any mention of promise of publication, and if it's taking, a, if, if they promise a really short uh, turnaround time, those are two things to really look forward to. 
uh, to, to lo really look for. I guess there's no 100% way um, that you can do it, but um, if you do a Google search of of the journal, um, if you can find that it's um, that it has a lot of uh, you know that it's been in publication for a few years, um, if you can if you can find it easily on the web and you can maybe do a search for it. Another thing might be to look for the um, the editorial board. Um, if you have if if there's a name that you recognize on the editorial board, that doesn't mean they have anything to do with the actual running of the journal. Um, but you know, a, a legitimate uh, journal will ask big names to be on their on their editorial board, and that's one um, one way to look at it. Uh, just to add to this, uh, Anne, I think you know mm -hmm. sometimes to see who are the publishers of those journals will be useful. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, we all know that Science Direct or Mm -hmm. Taylor Francis, uh, you know, they're good uh, publishers and they're reliable. So, you know, that's right. Maybe yes. That would be helpful too. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also think, you know, if, um, if the publisher is asking for processing money, yeah, mm -hmm. you can also be a bit cautious because usually yeah. the big journals, uh, the good journals do not ask for uh, money. So we can be cautious when the processing money is asked from us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, any more questions from the audience? Um, oh, uh, yeah. you I, just posted can I one. Come in? Okay. Yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah, but, uh, please, uh, Shamshad Bhai, probably you can go ahead first. No, Hasib, go ahead, Dr. Hasib. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 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 Dr. Howard, thank you very much. It has been an excellent uh, presentation and uh, I really like the frequent asked questions because Thank you. these are the very common one we often uh, struggle to, uh, to, to find answer to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think one issue has come up again and again is predatory journal or selecting journal. In the chat mm -hmm. box, I have shared a link. Uh, there's a concept called think, submit, check. It actually helps you to uh, find out which journal is, uh, is a non-predatory or good journal, because uh, okay. it's really quite uh, challenging to find those because there are 45,000 journals in the world. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is very, very tough. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would like to elucidate or I'd like to clarify a few things that asking for money is not, no harm because every journal needs to run and they have to have some money to get from the authors either from the authors or from the subscription fee. So asking money is not a problem. The problem is whether the journal is following the editorial process, especially the review. You have mm -hmm. rightly mentioned when a paper, when a journal says that within 72 hours, 72 hours I will publish your paper, mm -hmm. something is wrong, something is very wrong. Yes. Uh, so uh, I just, I would like to request just to go to that website they are very clear bullet point guideline. What are the issues we need to think of uh, before we choose a particular journal? Uh, there is a website used to be, now it is closed, Bell's List, uh, mm -hmm. which listed down all the predatory journals, but now because of some controversy that is mm -hmm. closed. Uh, Cables, uh, C-A-B-E-L-L -L probably, mm -hmm. they have got another website, but you can't access it, you have to pay. It is all about money, isn't it? The publishing industry. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I think that's the way to uh, avoid predatory journals. And of course, experienced researchers uh, from our discipline, they can always guide us. They can always help us to find out appropriate journals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that's a, that's a very good point. They. In Japan as well, sometimes um, you will be asked for money by a legitimate publisher. Usually, um, I've done that with a book, and usually they say, like, if you are accepted, you will be paying this much money to cover publication costs, is my impression. Whereas the predatory journal might, like, later say, okay, now you owe a, a bunch of money or something like that. I'm not, but I'm not sure how that works out. But this is a really good link that um, is in the chat box if um, you want to uh, check it. That sounds like a, a good uh, website to check. Amshad sir, would you like to ask your question? Well, uh, my question was about Scopus. Um, mm -hmm. For example, 
most of the employers um, or even the ranking agencies, so they demand that you know we have uh, scopus indexed publications, mm -hmm. and that makes us you know heavily rely on Elsevier, just like you know one agency. And you did mention there is a you know publication racket out there. So of yes. course editors are, are there, but at the same time, you know, there is a monopoly which has, you know, allowed the DOASH, the open access journal to, you know, open up. So like, you know, how do you strike a balance? Like, you know, this is my question that, you know, so when there is a demand for Scopus indexing, and then like, you know, you do realize as a, as a free academic that, you know, there should be other outlets where you should publish and where you should contribute. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that this sort of stranglehold that Scopus and Elsevier have on the um, on the public on academic publication will gradually be loosened, I hope. I mean, Scopus like Scopus does these bad things like they require you to they require you to have at least however many references from another Scopus publication. Um, and Elsevier, we all know, is is very, very, very tight with their content. Um, and um, yes, I wish I knew how to strike a balance. I am hoping that like the more that we support uh, more open access journals, the more quality um, stuff gets printed in there, the more uh, um, things will, will start opening up where, where those are more respected. Um, and you know, if you're on a hiring committee, maybe look past the, the the sort of Scopus index stuff and and look towards the more, you know, open it up to more uh, open access and stuff like that. But I, I honestly, I really don't know what we can do about it, except, um, you know, maybe maybe support the open access by submitting your quality work to them. There is a question from Jalaluddin. Yeah, but can I, can oh, I have sorry. a follow up yeah, question? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so, sure. uh, so our department journal, like you know, crossing, so we have applied for uh, Scopus enlisting, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the final round of you know being considered, but at the same time we're thinking of like you know applying to Doage, you know, so because we want to make it open access. Uh, the print version it has limited visibility, like you know, given our you know, so website does not have the SEO, and uh, we we don't have that aggressive you know, marketing that you normally see uh, in the you know, global north. So uh, do you recommend that, you know, we go for open access, like you know, as a new journal, like, you know, which is just like, you know, 10 years old, uh, do you think, you know, is this a good idea to get into open access or stick to the basics? Yeah, I'm sorry. I really wish I could answer that question, but, um, you know, from our, our perspective, I was the editor. We tried to be indexed and we were not able to um, because we don't have enough of a, of a pipeline of, of, uh, of articles where they could say, we'll be able to publish several, uh, you know, we have several planned for the future and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, all I know about uh, getting indexed is I sort of know about the process because I tried to do it, um, but I've never had to make a decision like that. So I'm afraid I can't really give you very much advice about that. Thank you. Sorry. So there is a question from Jalaluddin. I found some scholars who have been publishing scholarly articles continually even after um, plethora of rejections that they had to face earlier. Here, my question is, what are the critical and creative abilities in general that helps them overcome this rejection gray zone? Uh, that's true. Some people can just do that. And I think it's just, it, it's really a good idea to keep in mind that rejection is just part of the process. Um, every, probably everyone's been rejected. I know that my articles have been rejected um, before and um, it's, it's just important to maybe get that experience, maybe it's important to get the experience of being rejected a, a few times um, and, um, and just keep going on until you can, uh, until you can publish. I do recommend if you get uh, rejected by like a generalist uh, journal that you go for something that's a little bit more specialized. It, it, it is easier to get published in that, um, in that kind of thing and um, again, you already know that you're you're in the right 
uh, subject. Okay. Another question from Shanta Bishesh. Can I, can I quickly can sure. I quickly share my experience regarding rejection? Sure. Very quickly. Okay, uh, please. Now it it happened uh, a few quite a few years back. Uh, I I wrote an article and I submitted it and it was rejected seven times. Mm. So you have to ask yourself what you are. Mm -hmm. It is you who is doing things wrong. <laughs> uh, my realization was I wanted to publish what I wanted to publish rather than which is what is publishable. Uh, so you have mm -hmm. to look back mm -hmm. and try to understand why you are writing these things which nobody is appreciating per se. So mm -hmm. at the end, what I did, I took advice from uh, one of the senior person who was not the subject matter specialist, rather uh, she was a very uh, good science communicator. I, I'm, I'm from science background, I'm a biologist. So I totally reframe, totally re reprojected my research. And it was submitted kind of uh, without review. I mean, without any major changes because the editor, he liked the approach so much he, because I gave a very totally different view. So to answer to the question that how you overcome rejection, you have to look back uh, it is not always you have to push same thing again and again, because there is a problem with that, which uh, uh, Professor Howard also mentioned that would drawing a paper and submitting the same thing in different journal is bad, because you are, you will be getting the same reviewer reviewing your same manuscript, but for different journal. It is called reviewers common, because there are, there are a handful of reviewers who are reviewing so it is important to, uh, uh, I'm absolutely, uh, I'm very much in agree, agreement with uh, Professor Howard that rejection is part of, your, part of our life, but we need to understand why it got rejected. Is it because they didn't understand my, my writing or it is something I'm not doing uh, rightly? So that positiveness, that positivity is so important being a uh, researcher. Otherwise we will be struggling to publish our uh, research out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good point, I think. Yes. Yeah, very good suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the question from Shanta Bishesh, thank you so much uh, DEHU Lab for arranging such an excellent session for young researchers like us. Uh, you are welcome. So Dr. Howard, what types of journals should we choose to publish? Journals with print, ISSN, number or journals which have both print and online ISSN number? Hmm. I guess if it's both print and online, you would get your, uh, your work out uh, a little bit further, right? It would be a little bit more accessible to people. Um, that's what I would say. But, you know, um, basically look at the, the type of thing that the, the, the basic um, thing I would say is to look at what the journal publishes already. If you want to write, you know, if you want your article to be part of that, then that's uh, the journal that you should choose. Mm -hmm. So there was a comment uh, from Dr. Shaila Sultana. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way is to send the article to journal so that we consult for our own article. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the way I select journals for my own articles. Okay, that sounds good. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Hasibi Fanullah has uh, also shared a link for us for young researchers. Nice. Uh, Author Aid is a uh, very good platform with numerous resources on how to publish research papers. Please have a look at uh, and the, um, have a look at the membership is free for that uh, um, website. And uh, Shamshit sir has another question. Would you like to ask that question, Shamshit sir? It's not a question, it's just the idea, you know, oh, it's sorry. a good yeah. idea to have mm -hmm. a co-author, you know, mm -hmm. so for, for a young researcher, like, you know, if you have a mentor, you know, so with you, so is that a good way to, you know, stepping into the realm of uh, research and publication? Yeah, I absolutely think that's, you know, if you can find a good mentor who will be your co-author, that's the best way to get into publishing. Um, I, I don't know how you know, common, that's not, that's not possible for everybody. Um, and it has to be a good trustworthy mentor. Um, there are occasionally, there are times when the old, 
the older researcher will sort of push most of the work to the younger researcher and take the first authorship. I don't think that's super common, but uh, but you do have to, anytime you do research with somebody, you really have to know them well and trust them. But it's a really good way of, um, of getting started with publishing. Yes. So there are questions. There is another question from uh, Dr. M. Shafiqul Islam. Would you like to ask the question yourself? Uh, okay, thank you so much. Um, it's an interesting session. So just a query about this. Uh, what's your take on the completely different views of two reviewers for the same article? And what did you say about rejection of an article by a journal, but acceptance of the same article by a better journal? Okay, so um, that's those are really interesting questions. Um, uh, so um, when you have two reviewers, Generally, in the case of probably a, a generalist publication like like I was editing for, we would choose, in theory, one reviewer would be for the subject and one reviewer would be for the method. Um, and then if there was something like a, a complicated statistics or something, we might have an extra st uh, statistical reviewer. But in some cases, that's why you're gonna get two really opposed viewpoints where the method reviewer is going, oh, well, this is perfectly, you know, this is perfectly done within this method. And then the subject reviewer is saying that this is totally inadequate. So that's that's very possible. Um, but if they are completely different, um, like, so, when I was um, an editor, if I had one reviewer that said this should be rejected and I had the other reviewer say this needs minor corrections, then I would definitely go for a third reviewer. Um, I, it, it's hard to predict when when that's going to happen or, or why it's going to happen. Reviewers, again, are just they're just people with opinions. And um, so, you know, sometimes they are different, but the, the editor should sort of sort out really different opinions uh, about the or like really different views before they go on uh, to the author, I think. But uh, as, a, as an editor, do you send mm -hmm. the like, you know, opposing reviews to the author? Like, you know, how, how do you work? Or like to yourself and like, you know, sort it out yourself? Because as an um, editor, it, myself, like, you know, we face it all the time. Mm -hmm, yes, okay. So um, if I thought I could sort it myself, like, okay, as I said before, Sometimes I trust one, one reviewer more than another. And so in that case, I might just go with that reviewer's review or I will read both reviews. And in some cases, the one review just makes more sense than, than the other one. And I think the one review is more thoughtfully done or something. So sometimes the editor can make that choice. There were some times when I just didn't know enough about the subject to be able to see who was right. And in that case, I would send it to a, a third reviewer. Um, and then usually you can get like, like two out of three, or in some cases I had somebody I really trusted and I'd, I'd ask them for their opinion and, and see what happens. But I would try to sort it out so that before I sent my reviews on, um, I would be able to give them a, um, a decision of revise and resubmit or reject or, or minor corrections. I would be able to figure that out myself and then send that them send that to them and then sort of um, tell them what what which of those um, corrections that they were asked to do, which ones they should prioritize. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but often we get reviewers like you know with very like you know lazy and sloppy comments. Like you know they will just like you know. Uh, not going to detail, they will just, you know, oh, this is okay, like with minor changes and all that. But when you look at the paper, like, you know, when proofread for the actual publication, you realize you know, there were many issues. Uh, and at that point, if you want to intervene, because then the author has certain expectations about the publication process. Mm -hmm. And if you have to intervene at that late, late stage of publication, so uh, this is again, like, you know, one of the catch 22 situation. You know, so how do you deal with that? That is very difficult. And that um, that has happened to us as well. We got uh, two very brief reviews. I think uh, both uh, me and my, uh, my other associate editor, we both got, had times when both of the reviewers said minor corrections. And then at some stage we read it and realized, no, this, this 
paper really, really, really has problems. And in one of the cases we had to uh, turn reject it when it was on the verge of being printed. Um, and in the other case, um, I had to work with the author for like another year trying to, because we had already promised to print it. Um, it was a lot of work for me. So that's a problem I think everybody has. Um, you have to sort of check the reviews that are being written um, and, you know, check it against carefully against the uh, uh, article and maybe have other people um, check it as well. We used to have an Excel file of all of our reviewers. And if a reviewer does that, if they, if they send a sloppy review, then we would put a note and we wouldn't ask them to review for us again. Um, so that doesn't really that doesn't really solve the problem after it's happened. Um, but we do try to sort out our reviewers so that eventually you get like a pool of people that you can really trust. But it is, that's a problem. I, I don't really know right. uh, what to do about it entirely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add to that, you know, um, I do the editing for the journal. So I go through mm -hmm. all the papers after they're reviewed and, and they come back the revised copies come back and it's really a pain because uh, probably the idea is good and that's why the reviewer said it's okay and all that but when I go to you know really line edit and that's when all the problems really come out and uh, at that point you know you just want to give up and you want to get rid of it because you don't want to work so much on it to make mm -hmm. it um, but on that note can I just ask another question uh, uh, do you think it's a good idea to have um, more than one reviewer per paper? Is that does that work out better than just having one person do it and uh, end up with a sloppy review you can't really do anything about? Yeah, I think just for safety's sake, I like to have at least two reviewers. Um, one reviewer, one reviewer would have to be somebody that I knew was really good. I've had to do that occasionally in the past. Um, if we get a paper on a topic that nobody really knows anything about, like um, like phonetics, there aren't that many people who do phonetics, and their reviewers are really um, really thin on the ground. So um, we had to have a paper reviewed by one person. But in general, I just you know, I think even two people, it's it's just um, maybe leaving too much to chance. I'm not I'm not suggesting that we all have like six reviewers do it because that's just not uh, practical. But um, but I do think for safety's sake, it's better to have two reviews. Uh, I think the standard practice is two, mm -hmm. and then big journals um, we, they have three reviewers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's the case also. Yes. Uh, Dr. Shaila Sultana had a comment. Uh, Shaila, would you like to make that comment to yourself? No, it's nothing. Uh, that's my personal view. See that um, uh, I have strong reservation about publishing pain phase, and I discourage the young scholars and academics to do so because uh, I think that the you know, established old good journals do not ask for it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I personally do not publish because I think that um, the publishing houses are already doing business with my intellectual property. So um, then again, when I give them the processing fees, it means that they're doing twi business twice. So mm. I, I, don't, uh, I don't do that. And I, I strongly discourage the young researchers to fall into the trap of it. So better to you know, uh, improve your writing, improve your research skill and target the old established journals which do not ask for any processing fees. That is my personal views, but I respect, you know. Yeah, but then again, Shaila, like, you know, when you have a publisher like Sage, you know, asking for, you know, processing fee, or especially right. science, what I realized that, you know, so most of the science journals, so they insist on, you know, having subscription yeah. and processing I, say, I don't think so, because mm -hmm. the old journals, even in, in every discipline, there are established journals, which do not ask for processing fees. So I, I understand you can say that, all right, okay, you have written, you have published, and that is why easier for you to tell this for young researchers, perhaps it is not, but I was young once. Uh, so we just have to learn the craft of writing and researching so that we don't have to do that. It's a huge amount of money they ask, $300, $400. I have, I have heard from my uh, young colleagues and I really feel bad for them that they have to do it. Um, sometimes they have to pay $3,000 and eight of them write together, specifically in science. 
the amount processing fee fees is higher. Sometimes they ask for $3,000, $4,000. And eight people, eight researchers write together only to share the publication, uh, the processing phase. So that is why I have strong reservation, you know. Uh, there, there are other ways of working it out. That is my personal view. Mm. That's a, I think that's a good opinion. I think I, I you know, I, I think that sounds very reasonable. Um, I've only been asked for a processing fee uh, what, it was a book that I contributed to um, that my whole school had to do and we were not accepted. And so we didn't have, wind up not having to pay. And that was, my school was having, was doing it. And so I was sort of pressured to do it. But I, I do, um, I do see your point. Uh, may I ask another question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, sometimes it happens that I, I carry out research on Bangladeshi writing and uh, even Bengali literature in translation. And I submit the uh, articles to some established journals, but they uh, don't find the reviewers. And they say that um, uh, they do not have uh, the experts on these areas. So uh, mm. even many journals do not have the experts of those areas. So in that case, <laughs> what can we do? But those are established journals who look forward to publishing in those journals. So the established journals are telling you they don't have the, the reviewers to yeah, review? They say that they do not have the experts on these areas. So they look for, um, I mean, this has just other journals so where they, I mean, I mean, in most of the journals I have found that the um, experts are not available in those areas. Like uh, Bangalore Literature in Translation or any, any work in English, written in English from, uh, by Bangladeshi writers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't. Uh, I haven't heard about. I. I've, I've been asked to review a lot of things that I'm really not an expert in, and my experience has been that they'll just ask someone who's in the ballpark. They won't try to find um, uh, an expert. So certainly for for TESOL Journal, I once reviewed something about um, Kierkegaard's philosophy. I got permission to show it to a philosopher, but. I was just the only person who was willing to do it. Um, so it's, I've had kind of had that, the opposite experience where um, they're not, I mean, I guess they're trying to find the, the um, expert, um, but if they can't find somebody, they'll just, they'll just get a reviewer. Yeah. Thank so um, it's getting quite late at your place, um, Anne. So I think we should uh, wrap up this session. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, we will just wrap it up. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Anne, uh, for your very informative session. Um, I'm you. sure all of our participants uh, have benefited immensely from your presentation. And I saw many people were commenting at the chat box, uh, thanking us for organizing this and thanking you for uh, doing this for us. And uh, personally, I have learned a lot from this session. Uh, so right. thank you very much for doing this for us. And now I would like to invite our Honorable Pro-Vice Chancellor of ULAB and the Head of the Department of English and Humanities, Dr. Shamshad Murtuza, to offer his vote of thanks. Thank you, President. And thank you, Dr. Ann Howard. Like a, such, such a wonderful session and very informative one. Sometimes like, you know, we take things for granted, like you know, especially the senior teachers, we think that oh, like, you know, uh, this is something that our students should know. But unfortunately, we do not have the research culture. And I'm glad that you did mention that, you know, the difference between a uh, student paper and the actual research paper. This is a million dollar question because uh, most of our students, like when they do their thesis presentation, they think, that, oh, I can just upload it with, um, you know, so academic or research gate, and that will be considered as a publication. You know, or, you know, there are some uh, predatory uh, organizations out there like you know Lambert and others who will come after you and ask for your you know papers and then they will sell it to your you know peers you know that 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 is you know, a strange world and uh, we have to live with it but at the same time I'm really thankful to you for volunteering your time I know you had a long day so um, you mentioned that you know you were teaching today and uh, uh, this is quite late for you I'm sure I'm sure. So I really appreciate your time. 
And at the same time, the very fact that you are part of this THD group and you're volunteering your time and uh, you're very generous with your time and also your knowledge and the way you're sharing it with your colleagues, it shows that you, know, you are a wonderful human being. And that is absolutely um, important. And that should be one takeaway for all researchers here because it's all about sharing and caring. So the idea that you know you have been coming to Bangladesh for the last few years, you know, sharing thoughts, sharing your ideas, uh, that will inspire my colleagues here and also the students um, who, are, you know, so on the uh, novice on the order of publishing. So once again, thank you so much and thank you, Farzana, for like you know, so reaching out to Dr. Ann and making this happen. And at one point, we had more than seventy participants. So it shows that you know there is a genuine interest in research. Like you know, so when we say that our current generation is not interested in research and like you know we are sliding downward, but this is a positive sign, and uh, this is kind of a ripple in the pond. And I'm sure that you know, so we will create big waves uh, in the days to come. So uh, thank you, IT, and thank you, my colleagues, and thank you all our guests who have joined in, and thank you, uh, Dr. and uh, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoyed uh, talking with all of you. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for joining this session. And thank you again, Dr. Ann Howard. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank, thank you so care. much. Thank you. Stay yeah. okay. safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Hasib. Bye. Okay. No, no, it's a pleasure. Okay, yeah, thank you for all okay, your comments you. uh, and you. questions. Good. Well done. Uh, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Shaila. Thank, thank you, Arifa. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, all my colleagues and yeah, all the guests. Thank you so much. Hello. All right. Hasibha, I'll be in touch with you. All right, then. Take care. Thank you. I think we can stop the recording. I can help this. Yes.